In this lecture, we will cover a summary of portfolio management. What I am going to do here is actually first more or less combine two readings. So portfolio management and then the last reading. So they are related. So I'm going to connect the two and then the two middle readings are connected. So I will cover those together. The first important point to recognize is that you need to have a portfolio perspective on investing. What is this portfolio perspective or portfolio approach? It is that you evaluate individual investments by their contributions to the risk and return of an investor's portfolio. So you don't just look at the risk and return on a standalone basis. You look at the impact of the risk and return on the portfolio. Portfolio diversification helps investors avoid disastrous investment outcomes. If you put all your money in one or two stocks and they crash, then that is classified as a disastrous outcome. On the other hand, if you have a portfolio of well diversified instruments, then it is unlikely that all of them will crash at the same time. Portfolio diversification also helps investors reduce risk. So this is a critical term. There are many questions in the examples and at the end of this reading that focus on the importance of risk reduction. So by creating a portfolio, you don't really increase returns, but you do reduce risk. A measure that is mentioned sometimes is the diversification ratio, which is the risk of an equally weighted secure, which is the risk of an equally weighted portfolio of N securities divided by the risk of a single security selected at random. So if you have, let's say five securities and for simplicity, let's say that each of those securities has a risk of 20%. And then the risk of the overall portfolio, let's say is 10%. What is the ratio? The ratio is 10% over 20%, which is 0.5. Then you have another portfolio where this ratio is 0.8. Is that better or worse? Answer is that is worse. So lower ratio means that you have more diversification benefit. Composition matters for the risk return trade off. What this means is if you have a portfolio of three stocks, A, B and C, now, whether your, com your composition is one third, one third, one third, or whether it is 50% A, 25% B, and 25% C, that composition has an impact on the risk return profile. Portfolios do not provide guaranteed downside protection. All this is saying is portfolios help reduce risk, but they do not eliminate risk. Since portfolios are so important, we have several investment options which are called pooled investments and the examples are shown right here. Mutual funds and typically these require a small minimum investment. Exchange traded funds also require a small minimum investment. Then we have separately managed accounts which we'll talk about hedge funds and private equity. Hedge funds and private equity are covered in detail in alternative investments but we'll touch on these investment vehicles in this segment also. All right, mutual funds. A mutual fund is a co-mingled investment pool in which each investor has a pro rata claim on the income and value of the fund. So consider the following example, and this will explain the concept of co-mingled and pro rata. So co-mingled means that the money of different investors is mixed together or mingled together. That's where the term co-mingled comes from. Let's say that a mutual fund company, also called an investment firm, raises 100,000 from five investors and issues 10,000 shares. Each share then has a value of $10, which is simply 100,000 over 10,000. And then these are the five investors, depending on how much they have contributed, their ownership of that fund is on a pro rata basis, which means the ownership is based on how much they invested. And then obviously that defines the number of shares they have. Now, what does the investment firm do with this 100,000? Let's say that they buy stock. If they do so, then this would be called a stock mutual fund. Then let's say over the year, the value doubles from 100,000 to 200,000. 
then all these shareholders will be happy because their money will double. My, and then obviously investment fees are charged and so on, but their share goes up based on the value of the underlying stocks. Some terms that you need to know in the context of mutual funds. Net asset value, also called NAV, extremely important. So for a given fund, we add up the value of all the assets, subtract the liabilities. So that gives you the net asset value. Sometimes you'll see NAV PS, which means NAV per share. So you find the total net asset value for the whole fund and then divide by the number of shares. You can have open-end funds and closed-end funds. Open-end funds accept new investments and then issue additional shares. So if this were an open-end fund, then additional people, you could have XYZ and ABC also put in more money, in which case the fund would accept the money and issue more shares. These are also sometimes called evergreen funds. A closed-end fund says that once they have issued these shares, then any new money is not accepted. So then those shares only trade in the secondary market. So if John wants to get his money back, he will have to sell his shares in the secondary market. A high level point here is that generally open end funds trade at or very close to the net asset value because of the way they are structured. Closed end funds do not necessarily trade close to NAV. Ideally they should be, but they can be above NAV if the demand for shares is very high. But very often closed end funds trade below NAV. You can have a no load fund or a load fund. Some funds they charge a certain fee for putting money into the fund and then they charge money for taking money out. So those are called load funds. Funds can be categorized based on the type of investments. So if this fund collects money and puts all that money into the money market, then this would be called a money market mutual fund. If the money is going into bonds, then it would be called a bond mutual fund and so on. Next, we talk about exchange traded funds. Now, I will confess that understanding the detailed mechanics of an exchange traded fund is not that easy and we are not given too many details. At this stage, I would encourage you to simply remember what's on this slide. Like mutual funds, exchange traded funds are a pooled investment vehicle and are often based on an index. So you create this based on an index such as the S&P 500. This actually was the genesis of exchange traded funds. Now you can have exchange traded funds based on several other types of assets. But originally they were mostly focused on an index. With an index mutual fund, investors buy shares directly from the fund. With exchange traded funds, investors buy shares from other investors. Now this is a subtle point. You might say what's the difference between a mutual fund that's based on an index and an exchange traded fund. And that major difference is shown here. With an index mutual fund, investors buy from the fund, whereas with exchange traded funds, investors buy from other investors. So remember that point. Exchange traded funds combine features of closed end and open end. So they are close to open end in the sense that they generally trade close to NAV. So if we were to define the order, open end funds are closest to NAV, then come exchange traded funds, and then come closed end funds. So exchange traded funds track NAV like open ended funds, and they trade like closed ended funds. So you can buy and sell all day long. With open ended funds, you only buy or sell at the end of the day. You can buy on margin. So with exchange traded funds, you can buy on margin. With open end funds, you cannot buy on margin. Closed end funds and exchange traded funds, you can short sell. Open end funds, you cannot short sell. Expenses are lower relatively mutual. Expenses are low relative to mutual funds, but brokerage fee needs to be paid. Unlike mutual funds, exchange traded funds do not have capital gains distributions. So just remember these points. On the left is the method 
for creating exchange traded funds that I would like you to read. Other pooled investments. And here again, I simply want you to read through this, but very simplistically with separately managed accounts, each investor directly owns the shares. So you might have a manager who helps the investor decide what to buy and buys it, but the shares are under the name of the investor. This is not commingled. So the buying and selling can happen based on the tax scenario of the investor. Hedge funds, buyout, VC, you can read this, but I'll skip it here because you see this in detail in alternative investments.